And now, HBO Sports presents The Curious Case of Kurt Flood. following is a special presentation of the HBO Sports documentary series, Legends and Legacies. In the history of man, and there's no other profession except slavery, where one man is tied to one owner for the rest of his life. In slavery, they just shift you from one plantation to the other. In baseball, they do the same thing. They ship you from one franchise to the other, depending upon the whims of 24 millionaires. You say, all right, Kurt Flood, you're making money. You make $100,000 a year. Well, that's not the point. The point is, I don't want anybody to own me. That belongs to me. Kurt came up to the office and we went out for lunch. Marvin and I were very curious to determine why he was really thinking about this. I said, you're one of the outstanding players in baseball today, but a case like this could take years. I wanted to make sure that Kurt understood that this was A, no simple matter, B, that it was a a million and one shot, in my opinion. It was at the time an outlandish notion that a ball player should have the right to choose the team for which he played. But at New York's Summit Hotel on November 24, 1969, Kurt Flood seemed hell-bent on doing something outlandish to earn that very right. All the questions that were asked were to determine whether Kurt was the Jackie Robinson on this issue. I said to him, if the million to one shot came home and you won it, you're never going to collect any damages. Kurt thought about that for a minute and he said, uh, still, if we won, it would benefit all the other players. I said, yeah. And the players to come. I said, yeah. He said, that's good enough for me. When the 31-year-old Flood left lunch that day, his mind had been made up. He was going to sue the game of baseball. Consequences be damned. Boy, something's going to happen to this man here. He ain't never going to play no more. The establishment in baseball, boy, they, they're just as through with me as they can possibly be, and I know it. You'll never really be able to tell why. I still don't see where it really came from because if you ask me before, would Kurt Flood be the kind of guy to sue baseball? I'd say no. Until that point, I didn't know that Kurt really had that type of thing in him. If that fateful decision by Curtis Charles Flood remains a mystery to some, its origins perhaps could be traced as far back as 1915 and a small town in Louisiana where a young woman decided one day she'd simply had enough of the way things were. She was out shopping in an expensive store, and this Caucasian woman came up to her and said, can you tell me where I can find me a nigger bitch to clean my house? Kurt's mom said, I don't know any nigger bitches to clean your house. 
and the woman slapped her. She slapped her back. So naturally the fight began and mother had to leave there because they were gonna lynch her. Laura Ricks fled the segregated South, eventually landing in relatively tolerant Oakland, California. There, she settled down with her second husband, Herman Flood, and raised six children. Kurt was the baby. She was busy with all of them, but Kurt was special. You could kind of tell she had a fondness for him. Kurt learned as a grown man that he was poor. But as a kid, he didn't know he was poor. His mother had sheltered them in this ghetto in Oakland to make them not feel deprived or put up on. Mother was always seeing that we had music lessons. And Herman Sr. painted. He also played music. Kurt's dad had worked with his dad in a traveling music group. So the family was very, very musical. But young Kurt was drawn to more traditional boyhood pursuits. A lot of times we would be doing family things, but we had to drop Kurt off with the little league team. He wanted to play baseball. He was usually playing ball with his older brother, Carl, who was a phenomenal athlete and who Kurt idolized as a, as a kid. Carl was a different cut. Carl was more cunning more cutting, and he would fight. Carl got in trouble with the law and everything. He got sent down to one of those juvenile places, and of course that really broke Kurt's heart. By the time he was 18, Carl Flood had been arrested nearly a dozen times. Little brother Kurt, meanwhile, was making a very different impression on folks in West Oakland. What stuck out about Kurt was his being curious about things. He was a bright candle, and he made sure you knew he was there. At 14 or 15, I would have been surprised if he didn't get to the big leagues. He had that much ability. He'd make great catches that looked normal. As soon as he heard a crack in the bat, he knew where the ball was going to go. He turned his back, and he ran. And Turn around and made it look easy. Soon after finishing high school in 1956, Kurt Flood was signed by the Cincinnati Reds. Just 18, he was on his way to the majors. First stop, spring training in Tampa, Florida. It's his first time he'd been on a plane, and he's so excited. He had this brochure they had sent to all their prospects of this beautiful hotel in Tampa called the Floridian. Kurt hails a cab and says, take me to the Floridian. He was thinking, I'm going to meet the other guys, and I can have lunch, and I'm going to be in a big hotel. So he gets to the hotel, and he presents himself. The guy stops him, and he says, you with the minor league team? And Kurt said, yeah. Porter took his stuff, took him out the back door of the hotel, flagged down a colored taxi and they send him to the black section of town where all of the Reds' black talent is staying. He realized that he was in a completely different world. From the time someone made me stay in the colored section when the white kids stayed on the beach, I felt like a nigger. In one of the minor league towns, Kurt could not dress with his teammates. He had to dress in this steel corrugated lean-to on the outside of the clubhouse. And one day, when he went to have his uniform clean between games of a doubleheader, Flood discovered just how cruel Jim Crow could be. He can see that the guys are taking their uniforms off and throwing them into this pile on the floor. So he takes his uniform off, and then all of a sudden he hears this yell. The clubhouse guy is just cursing, and he runs and he gets a long stick with a nail in it, and he picks Kurt's uniform out of the pile of uniforms, and they take it to the black cleaners. 
He sat there and started crying. And he was naked and it was hot. And the guys inside were just chit-chatting and having a great old time. I think it is something that he could never forget. When you lose your dignity, you lose an awful lot. How do you now regain that? It wasn't something that you talked about. If you were going to make it to the major league, you just had to, you know, buck up. But even after Flood was traded to St. Louis in 1958 and made the major league club, he quickly learned, courtesy of his manager, Solly Hemus, that life in the big leagues brought its own brand of racial injustice. You're not only being denied the opportunity to play, but you're told that you don't have the ability to play. Solly told him that he should probably quit baseball and try something else. He told me the same thing. It didn't affect him nearly as much as it did me. At least he wasn't as vocal as I was. He was very, very quiet. You could see the mind working. You could, you could almost see the stomach churning and hear it churning. And if Flood's rage was silent, its roots could be found in the path blazed by an icon from a not-so-distant age. Jackie Robinson was his Superman, his God. He was his hero, his absolute hero. He emulated him by wearing Jackie's number. He would be influenced by anything that Jackie was doing. So in 1962, when Robinson invited a group of black athletes to a rally in Mississippi and asked Flood to come along, Flood rushed to stand by his idol's side. I want you to pay tribute to three wonderful fellows. For Jackie to invite him and do anything with him, that fell right into things because now Kurt is in that same arena. My baseball career is just starting. Many of you, I'm sure, have never heard about me, but this career with the NAACP is just starting as well. If one, if you don't hear about me in one, I'm certain you will hear about me in the other because I'm really sincere about our civil rights. I was in Mississippi and just happened to bump into Kurt. I didn't think he should be down there because he could get hurt. I don't think he knew the enormity of what he was doing. Their host is Medgar Evers. A year later, Medgar Evers is shot in the back and killed. I talked to several people here, and they were saying how grateful they were to me for coming down here to, to do this for you. Well, that's not the truth. I, uh, I came down here because of myself and my children, because they are certainly affected by it, just as yours are. If there's anything that I can ever do as far as this fight for freedom is concerned, certainly count on me. Thank you very much. Kurt Flood had found his political voice. While back in St. Louis with a new manager, he was finding his professional footing too. Starting in center field for the 1964 world champion Cardinals. Away from the field, with a young wife, four small kids and another on the way, Flood was also the picture of personal success. But when he sought to move his family out to the Bay Area suburbs just weeks after the 64 World Series, the leaser, upon learning his new tenants were black, threatened to hold the house hostage at gunpoint. And the fight for freedom which Flood had spoken of in Mississippi was suddenly at his doorstep. Of all places where you would think it would be most welcome, World Series hero and still your blackness was something that you had to deal with. They filed for a preliminary injunction, a court order, armed police protection. They searched the entire house for bombs and moved Kurt and his family into that home. Television cameras rolling the entire time. There's a great deal of pride involved here. How, how can they do this? Not because I'm a professional athlete or because I'm a, a Negro even, but I, I am a human being. Regardless of what I am, I, I think that if I can afford this, this place, I think that I certainly ought to have it. The easiest thing for Kurt to do in that Alamo experience was to rent another house. But he took on this racist with a shotgun through the court system. And he was vindicated by the court system. What good do you think could come out of this? Well, I think that the notoriety that's undoubtedly going to be involved here, uh, 
will make people aware, if nothing else, that that prejudice is is not only confined to the southern part of our United States, and if they if they move their mustache and look under their nose, that they find it right here at home too. Uh. Alamo was a horrific experience for us as children. To be confronted with racism at three years old, you know, it's scary. And the trauma deepened for the flood kids when their parents split just months after moving in and their father moved away for good. The fact that they were separated wasn't different than they were separated while he was working. Dad was always gone, and I missed him. I missed him most all of my life. Batting second and playing center field, number 21, Kurt Flood. Kurt loved the game. I think the ballpark is where he really thrived. Kurt Flood was a hell of a ball player. There they drive in a deep right. Flood playing it beautifully. He was very well known for climbing the walls and catching balls. Watching him catching the ball was like watching pretty girls go by. The next one was better than the last one. He made a play at Wrigley Field once in the vines that I'll never forget, and everybody was just dumbfounded that a man could do that as gracefully as Kurt did. In a National League stocked with some of the best outfielders in baseball history, Flood, all five foot nine of him, stood as tall as any. A perennial gold glove recipient, Flood once went an entire season without making a single error. Kurt Flood was an extraordinary overachiever. He must have had extraordinary inner drive, but it was all personal and it was all ambition. Here's Kurt Flood, the premier defensive center fielder in the National League. He was a pesky little guy. You know what I mean? He, he was a, a guy that, uh, I call him Nats, that put their bat on the ball all the time. That's what Kurt was. Kurt Flood, the most consistent hitter for the Cardinals all year. He was a guy that you could depend on day in and day out. And you were always going to get a top flight job, just doing things to help the ball club. On the field, there was no more reliable cog in the Cardinal machine. But off of it, there was no individual more distinct. Kurt was a renaissance man before the term renaissance man was coined. Kurt could play a piano. He went to spring training. He came with a ukulele and pretty much taught himself. If we'd had a couple of hula girls out there, uh, he could have played a song or two for them. If there was any game that took coordination, he would do it. And then he'd put it down and say, you got anything else you want me to do? He was gifted, that's the word gifted. The first thing I learned as a teenager that made me think of him being very different was that he was an artist. I had never heard of a athlete being an artist before. We always had a sketch pad in the clubhouse and if somebody had their kids in there he'd be sketching their kids or something and then give them the sketch which was a nice thing. In 1967 Flood traded his pencil for a paintbrush and opened Kurt Flood Associates, a studio that did photography work and featured Flood's paintings. Soon, his commissioned work began popping up all over St. Louis, while a portrait he did of Martin Luther King brought him national acclaim. Flood is an interesting fellow. He's quite a portrait painter. So prolific was Flood as a portrait artist, teammates took to calling him Rembrandt. He had volunteered, Joe, anytime you want me to do something. He asked me, do you have a picture of your kids? I said, well, I got a picture of me and my two girls. He said, well, would you let me use it? And then he painted that. 
He painted a picture of my son and daughter. It was beautiful. It was like, how could he do that? Because all he had was a photo, right? Painted Gussie's picture and presented it to him down in spring training. And Gussie got a little bit choked up at the time. There was no better way for Kirk to ingratiate himself with the owner of the Cardinals. Bush loved this portrait. And this is just one reason, in addition to his amazing catches, why he really was Gussie Bush's favorite. Flood was a St. Louis treasure. And in the late 60s, his profile only heightened when he began dating a movie star, a young beauty named Judy Pace. When we would go into places, especially within the African-American community, there would be a little chaos. And he loved it. If the start of his baseball career had been stained by injustice, Flood found his prime painted by the perks of success. Kurt had a magnificent penthouse. He always had a Cadillac and a closet full of clothes and jewelry and artwork in the apartment. He did live well. He enjoyed life as much as he could. Footloose and fancy free. And that's the way Kurt seemed to me, a free spirit. I was not the only person that Kurt was dating. He had different girlfriends. He lived the life of a ball player who's young, single, and the women adore. If that weren't enough, Flood also happened to play for one of the best teams in baseball. After winning their second World Series in four years in 1967, the Cardinals, behind the Cy Young award-winning season of Flood's roommate, Bob Gibson, reached the Fall Classic again in 1968. And in the deciding Game 7 against the Detroit Tigers, Gibson was on the mound seeking his third victory of the series. With two on and two out in the seventh inning, the score was tied at zero when Detroit's Jim Northrup stepped to the plate. Northrup hits the ball to all fields. Northrup hit a line drive to center field. Well hit line drive. Fly ball, flood. Hey, almost won. He just catches it over his head. Two runs are going to score. The same thing almost happened earlier in the game to Jim Northrup, and now it has happened to one of the greatest defensive center fielders in baseball, Kurt Flood. First of all, I didn't see the ball. The, the background here is not very good. I, I didn't think the ball was hit as well as it was. And then when I realized it, I tried to re reverse my feel and I slipped. He got stuck in the mud. The rain the night before was torrential and uh, center field was muddy. He took that one step in and he couldn't recover. It was just circumstances, you know. Shit happens. You think you could have made the play on the ball if you picked it up right off his bat? Well, I don't know. We were just talking about that, and uh, I, I really don't think so. You're coming back next year? Of course we are. We'll see you the same time right here next year. But Flood's public nonchalance belied a private agony. He was devastated. Northrop. And it was like it was on a loop. He would just keep replaying and replaying and replaying. And he was just wanted to stop. He felt like he let everybody down. Our society has a way of blaming people. And Kurt was the guy who was blamed for this, and I've always thought it was ludicrous and unfair. That error started the whole dismantling of the life that he had, the life he had worked so hard for.
Kurt smoked. And uh, I would wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, smelling smoke, and he was sitting on the side of the bed smoking, one cigarette after another. He'd never say what was bothering him, but he'd sit there and smoke cigarettes all night. Is that a person with something on their mind? Absolutely. What is it? I don't know. As great as he was on the ball field, he was a horrific businessman. His finances were a mess. He was a guy who was more preoccupied with getting dressed to go out than getting his bills paid or doing the minutia of being alive in the United States. Uh, that was not his forte. Flood was making more than just about anyone in St. Louis. But he was spending more, too. And after the 68 season, he had stopped paying alimony and child support. And when his ex-wife filed for more money at the start of 1969, Flood found himself in no position to pay. So he looked to the Cardinal family for relief. Kurt wants $100,000. And he says, I'm not coming to spring training until I get that $100,000 contract. To hold out on Gussie Bush after dropping the fly ball really annoyed Gussie Bush. I think it more than annoyed Gussie Bush. Bush gave his center fielder a raise. But just a few weeks later, another dose of flood family drama deepened the rift between the owner and his favorite player. Kurt's brother was there at that time because Kurt had brought him from Los Angeles after he was let out of jail to try to help straighten him out. He gave him a job in the photography studio and Carl was doing a pretty good job, he thought. Carl is just sort of a tornado plowing through that mix. He's got a heroin addiction. He's just a bad guy. Kurt gets a call from Mr. Bush and he hears this voice just yelling at him. You brought Carl here. He's embarrassed the whole team. He's on the news. He held up a jewelry store in St. Louis, and virtually the entire incident was captured on tape. They commandeered an empty police car to try to make their getaway. I think they got a total of two blocks away before they were apprehended. It was not well conceived, it was not well carried out, and it ended in disaster. Kurt was heartbroken. He couldn't have been any more upset than he was. But he was upset that Mr. Bush was blaming him for his brother robbing the jewelry store. That was the nail. I rode to the ballpark with him every day. And one day, his parking place wasn't there. The bat order, usually when you order bats, liggity split, them bats are there. I mean, all of a sudden, Kurt didn't have his bats. His life is starting to fray. He said, they're going to get rid of me. I said, no. No, they can't get rid of you. He would say that just about every other night. He said, they won't get rid of me. The articles in the newspapers were very, very powerful. Even Harry Carey was saying, oh, wouldn't it be great to see Dick Allen in this lineup? What? Where'd that come from? They were only rumors, but Flood's response to them was absolute. He says, I'm not going. I don't care where it is. I'm not going. Kurt gets a phone call from someone in the Cardinals' front office who he describes as a middle echelon coffee drinker. Kurt, you've been traded to the Phillies, you and McCarver. I'm very sorry, and hangs up. The morning after, Kurt was in my office. I had never seen him so upset about anything at any time. After 12 years, seven gold gloves, and two World Series titles, Flood had been told his services were no longer needed. <laughs> 